Amen. You may be seated, church. Hey, I already said it once before, but Merry Christmas. Man, it's, uh, I love this time of year just to be in awe of who Jesus is. Uh, as a church family, uh, during the Christmas season, we've been walking through the Christmas story uh, that's been laid out for us in the book of Luke. Uh, Luke is, <laughs> let there be light. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I got ADD, folks. You know, I saw it and I had to go out. Right? But Luke, Luke is a writer that pays attention to the details. Right? We're grateful for that. Lord uses him to write out the story of Jesus' birth. In our first week, we saw an angel come to Mary who was betrothed to Joseph, and he tells Mary that the Lord is with her. And he says in verse 30, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. This is the announcement, church, that Jesus is coming. And when Mary asks, how will all of this happen, like she's not been with the man, the angel says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. For with God, nothing is impossible. And when we continue to read, we see Mary, and she responds to this news. What really awesome news, but terrifying news that would have been for her. But we see her response, and she responds with gratitude and with joy and with a heart of surrender. And so now it's almost time for her to give birth. And so today we come to, I would say, the most amazing miracle. We come to a passage that changes our lives, changes the world, changes eternity. If you would, church, would you open your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 2, where we're going to read about the birth of Jesus. Church, at Christmas time, this is our focus, right? And I hope we never get tired of reading of the birth of Jesus. Let us never stop being in awe of how he came and why he came and who he is. It's been said that the more you think about the birth of Jesus, the more astonishing it gets. You ever read a passage and you're like, oh, I didn't see that there before, right? The more we read it, the more astonishing it gets. I hope that we will continue to see how amazing this miraculous moment in history is. My prayer, I've been praying, church, is that we would see Jesus for who he is, that we would be in awe of Jesus, and that he would change our hearts and our lives and our, and our eternities today. I hope we see and know that Jesus is worthy of all of our worship. He's worthy of all of our praise. He's worthy of your and mine and all of our surrender, church. This morning in Luke chapter 2, as we read the birth of Jesus, we're going to see four truths about Christmas, four reasons as to why we can rejoice. We've been focusing about that all month, right? right? The good news of great joy for all people. Why can we rejoice? So we're going to see four reasons why we can do that. And this morning and tonight at our Christmas Eve candlelight service, we get to rejoice at the birth of Jesus. So join me in Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. We're going to read all 21 verses today, but we'll read through them as we go through the sermon today. But let's begin by looking at the first five verses. We're going to see four truths, four reasons as to why we can rejoice. But first, church, let's go to God in prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you for John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life with him. God, we thank you that you are the God of miracles. You do miraculous things. You do wonders. And we celebrate today the wonder of Jesus' birth. God, help us praise you, help us rejoice, help us surrender to you today in whatever you ask of us. We ask this in Jesus' name, and God's people said, amen. Luke chapter 2, verse 1, here's what God's word says. Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabitants of earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register, along with Mary, who was engaged to him, 
and was with child. So in these first uh, five verses, we see a truth, we see a reason as to why we can rejoice at Christmas. And I think this is a, 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 a truth that we can often miss. Number one, we can rejoice today because church, God is in control. We're going to talk about that. When we, when we began our Christmas story in Luke chapter 1, we see an angel of the Lord come to Mary. Gabriel comes to Mary, and he comes to her in a town called Nazareth, right? He comes to Nazareth. This is a small, obscure town, but this is where both Mary and Joseph live, right? This is where they're going to do life together. This is where they have grown up. And remember, they were betrothed. It's important to know this. This is much more binding than our engagements to be married here right? This is a legal binding relationship. If there was a separation, it caused for a legal divorce, right? This is a big deal, right? It lasted for about a year as they prepared to come together as husband and wife at their wedding and to come together physically. But they both live in this town of Nazareth. And the angel tells her that Mary will carry and she will give birth to Jesus, the Savior. But when we look to the Old Testament church, we actually see where the child, where the Savior from God is supposed to come from. And it's not Nazareth. We look at Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, it tells us from the promised one, or that the promised one from God, the Savior would come from Bethlehem. In Micah, God says this, Bethlehem, you are a small, you are small among the clans, you're small among the towns in Judah. It was a small town, small population. But God says, Bethlehem, from, from you, one will go forth from me to be ruler in Israel. His origin, God says, is from long ago, from the days of eternity. God is telling them that Bethlehem is where the Savior, the Lord Jesus, would be born. But Mary and Joseph are both living in Nazareth, but she's carrying the Savior church. And so look at how God orchestrates this whole thing. We see in verse 1 through 3 that God uses a man named Caesar Augustus, a very powerful man. It says, now in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabitants of earth. You go to verse 3, and everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. So he demands that everyone has to go and be registered, and he said, each one of you go to your own city. Here's what that means. Go to the city of your family's origin. And so Joseph, in the line of David, was a descendant of King David, and David, King David, is from Judea. Here's what we see in verse 4. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to where? To Judea, to the city of David, which is called what, church? Bethlehem. Because he was of the house and family of David in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. It's great important information historically, but this is not just historical information. It's also showing us that our God is in control. Our God is in charge of the details because God is using this powerful worldly ruler to orchestrate his plan. God uses Caesar to fulfill the promise that the Savior would be born in Bethlehem. Don't miss the significance of what God is doing here. God is showing us that he is the one in charge, church. In their day, Caesar Augustus is the man. Right? He's the man. He's in charge. He's the ruler of the known world. Not long before this, Caesar had just defeated, and his army had just defeated his last real challenger at that point in battle. Meaning he's basically the supreme ruler on earth, right? He's the, he's, he's the supreme ruler to the people in the known world. But God does something here. He shows us who the real ruler is. Right? It's God because God uses Caesar Augustus here without him even knowing it. God uses Caesar and his decree to make a way for Mary and Joseph to travel to the city where Jesus, the Savior, was to be born in the little town of Bethlehem. The town that God promised that the King and the Christ and the Savior would come from. Here's a cool thing, church. God uses all kinds of people, all kinds of means, and all kinds of situations to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. Maybe today you needed to hear that and be reminded that this world isn't ultimately in control. No world leader is ultimately in control. Only God is. God is the one who sits on the throne. He's a God of the details. He is a God that keeps his word. And just a simple but important reminder that even the most powerful nation, 
even the most powerful ruler, even the wealthiest, even the most well-known, they still answer to God. We rejoice because he's in control. Then we come to the best part of the story, church, verse 6 through 7. Mary and Joseph are arriving from Nazareth to Bethlehem. It's a difficult journey, more than 70 miles, some of it, a lot of it's through mountainous terrain. And Mary was not just pregnant, she's really pregnant, church, right? They didn't have any quick trips for bathroom breaks. They didn't have any Walmarts, right? They didn't have any of that to stop at. What a hard journey this would have been for her. So after 70 plus miles, they make it to this little town of Bethlehem. Verse 6, while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Before we get to our next truth, just a little bit of context. Bethlehem was not a big place. But there would have been a whole lot of people here because this is an ancient town with a lot of history, church. And there's a lot of people coming to register for the census. And here in Bethlehem, Mary comes in really pregnant. And this is where she gives birth and lays her child. She lays Jesus, the one who always has been, she lays him in the manger. Because there was no room for them in the inn. Just picture this for a moment. We often picture, we see it on, on, uh, in books, we see it in cards. Mary and Joseph going from the hotel to hotel, knocking on the door. We often picture this mean old innkeeper coming out and telling him, get out of here, there's no room for you. But the word that Luke uses here, talking about the inn, could be an inn. But it, it, could, it could equally be talking about a guest room in a home. It's any lodging place. More than likely, church, this was homes. You had homes where people would open up spaces for others to stay. And so these families would say, hey, I've got, I've got family coming in, right? They get first priority, right? But then others that come in, we may rent out a space for them. And when Mary and Joseph got there, all the rooms, all the homes, all the lodging places were full. And so she has to give birth and she places the baby in a manger. Now, let's, let's see this amazing reality and this amazing truth and the amazing reason as to why we can rejoice this Christmas. First, we rejoice because no matter what's going on in our life, God is always in control. Truth and reason number two, we rejoice this Christmas because of the wonder of Jesus' incarnation. Verse 7 says, And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger. The word incarnation is a word you should know. It's an important word. We often sing about it. We talk about it, especially at Christmas, right? In the song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. There's a line in there, say, there's a line in there that says, Hail the incarnate deity, right? Deity is God, right? This, but it's important to know what the word means and what it means for you. Incarnation comes from a Latin word, which means to take on flesh, to become flesh. It means that he came to become one of us. Jesus is deity. Jesus is God. Jesus is the God. And he is God, the Bible says, who came to us and became flesh. We see in verse, or we see in John 1.14, we're going to talk more about this tonight, but it says, and the word, and we know the word is Jesus, and the word Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the incarnation, church. God, the one that sits on the throne, the ones that angels worship and bow down to, the one that speaks and creation happens. He became flesh. In John 1, in the verses before verse 14, we see that Jesus is in fact God. We'll see more of that tonight. But we, he is in fact God. And in verse 14, we see that he, God, became flesh. When we look back at the announcement of Jesus' birth in Luke chapter 1, we see who this child is. The angel says in Luke one thirty one, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. Now remember, names have meanings. Right? They have meaning. And the angel says his name is Jesus. And we've talked about this. The, the word Jesus, the name Jesus, means the Lord is salvation. Not the man is salvation, or the dude is salvation, or that person. The Lord is salvation. It means God saves. The Lord saves, right? Jesus is the Lord God who saves. 
Matthew 1, an angel comes and tells Joseph the same thing. She, Mary, will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Again, his name, for he will save people from his sins. So Jesus is God, the Lord who saves. And then in Matthew 1, verse 23, he says to Joseph, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and you shall bear a son, and they shall call his name what, church? Emmanuel, which translated means, say it with me, God with us. That's who he is. He is God with us. He came and became with us by taking on flesh. Jesus, the baby born here in Luke 2, he is God and he is with us. Jesus came to us. He became flesh to dwell among us. He came from heaven, church, to a manger. You know what a manger is? It's a feeding trough. Let that sit with you for a second. The God that created everything is in a feeding trough, hanging out in our skin. He came for all, and we see here how he came humbly. And we rejoice this Christmas because Jesus, the Lord who saves, God with us, the eternal God, he has come, church, and he became flesh. God came to be a man, fully God and fully man. What a reason to celebrate. It doesn't make any sense, does it? But he came, and he came to us, leaving heaven to intentionally come to our mess, to be with us in our mess, to experience our mess, and to rescue us from our mess. So we rejoice that God, Jesus, came to be with us, to become like us, to live in our world, and to save us. If that doesn't make you say, wow, you're missing it. Jesus, God, did the impossible. He came to us to be with us so we could be with him forever. This is one of those things that we should think about and read and reread and study and restudy and pray about each year, and it should always leave you in awe. This morning, tonight, tomorrow, we are celebrating the wonder of his incarnation that the God of the universe came and took on flesh to be with us. And then we come to the angelic announcement that he is here. When someone is born, my wife loves to know all the details, right? Loves to know all the details. Hey, babe, they had their baby. He's good. What color hair do you have? I don't know. Had a baby. He's good. How big was he? I don't know. They had a baby. He's good. Right? How much did he weigh? I don't know. He had a baby. Or they, not he. <laughs> no matter what culture says, okay? <laughs> she had a baby, right? He's good. Are you with me, church? Like, y- y'all ladies want to know all the details. Like, we ain't got it. We don't know. But the angel knows the details about Jesus being born, knows the details. He's born. Jesus has come. Look at verses 8 through 14 with me. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them. Guys, it's nighttime. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord, church. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with that angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. We rejoice because God is in control, church. We rejoice at the wonder of his incarnation coming to become flesh, to be with us. And rejoice because his birth, his coming is the good news of great joy for all the people, church. The angel comes to these shepherds and tells them of the good news. The angel says, do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. The angel is saying, listen up. You don't want to miss this. I'm about to tell you some really good news. I've got a birth announcement with all the details you need to know. News that will bring you great joy, great joy even for you, shepherds, and for people everywhere for eternity. And here's the good news for today in the city of David. 
There has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The good news of great joy is Jesus, church, and who Jesus is, right? The angel says that the baby was just born. He is the Savior. He is the Christ, and here's what that means. It means that Jesus is the Savior. We can rejoice Jesus is the Savior. This child was born. He is here from heaven. He is God with us, and he came to save you. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, even those people, even you, that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, and whoever would believe in Jesus would not perish, but have eternal life. I love the truth out of 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 4. It says that our Savior, Jesus, desires all to be saved, even the shepherds, even you. Even me. Jesus coming as Savior is really good news. You know why? Because you need a Savior. I need a Savior. We need someone who can forgive us of our sins and rescue us from the consequences and the wages of our sin. He came to be our Savior because we need to be saved. So by Jesus coming, God is saying, don't miss this church. Jesus coming, God is saying to you and me, you need him. You need to be saved. And Jesus is the one to do that. God has given us a gift of a Savior because we need one. At Christmas time, we often give and open gifts. Young people, kids, you like gifts? Amen? All right. Man, it's what we do, right? We, we open, we give gifts. And imagine that you unwrap a gift that is given to you. It's handed to you by someone that loves you. It has your name on the tag. And you tear the paper open. My wife just rips the paper open. I want to save it so I can reuse it. But when you tear it open, you find some deodorant. My wife didn't give me deodorant. Now you receive this gift because someone is telling you, I love you, but you need this. So please receive it and use it. You get the next gift and it's got your name on it. You're trying to figure this out, right? You open it up. It shakes a little bit and you find out it's a bottle of mouthwash. Somebody's telling you, I love you, but you need this. Please receive it and use it. And it might be hard for you to accept that gift, church. Because you have to admit that your armpits stink. <laughs> you have to admit that your breast stinks. Y'all remember it's the first time your mom gave you daughter, aren't you? You have to admit that you need it. But once you realize that that person that loves you was right, you might be a little more thankful for the gift because you realize they're giving you something that you need because they love you, hopefully. Maybe they'll love you more if you use it. But God is telling us, church, here's a gift. Jesus. Got your name on it. Please open it and receive it. Because it's the Savior you need. I sent him to you. He is here because you need him. God is saying with this gift, please realize that you need him. Please believe in him. Please trust him. Please call on him to be the savior because you need him. And we don't have to hope that God loves us by giving us this gift. We can know because we see church in the life of Jesus while we were still sinners. Christ left heaven, came down to us, fully God, fully man. He's fully sinless, but yet he died a sinner's death. He died for your sins, proving that he loves you and proving that he is the Savior that we need. Church, just like we have to recognize that our armpits stink and our breath stinks, we have to recognize that we have sin and it stinks. We have to recognize we're in a mess. And we have to recognize that we can't save ourselves. We rejoice because Jesus is our Savior. The Bible says clearly that all have sinned, even you, even me. 
and all we have to do is to look around and to look at our own life, we can clearly see there's sin all around, church. And because of our sin against a perfect and holy God, we are separated from Him. We live in a broken world and we're spiritually dead, chained to our sin, and there's nothing we can do about it. But Jesus came as the gift, the Bible says, to save us from our sins. He came to save us from the consequences of what we deserve for our sins. He came to forgive us and to give us a new life with him. We rejoice, church, because the one born at Christmas, Jesus, is the Savior we need, church. Right? He is the gift, and all we need to do, we can't earn it, church. We just need to trust in Jesus and call on him to save us. Receive him. Believe him. We rejoice, number two, because Jesus is the Savior and Jesus is the Christ. Your translation might say he's the Messiah, but it's the same name. Christ is the Greek name for Messiah, and it means the anointed one. It's the promised one. This is good news of great joy because Jesus being the Christ, you know what this is doing, church? It's, he's telling us that when we open that gift of Jesus, it is God saying, I kept my word, church. He's the one I told you was coming. You've been waiting for him. He's here. I told you I'd keep my word. Church, we see sin enter into the world in Genesis chapter 3 with Adam and Eve. But right away in that same chapter, God tells us I've got a Savior who is going to come and crush the head of Satan. First mention of the gospel. But we see the promised one throughout the Old Testament in places like Numbers 24, Isaiah 7, 9, 42, and 53, in Micah 5. These and many other places, they all tell of the promised Messiah, the one who would come, church. We celebrate at Christmas because Jesus comes as a gift, as the Christ. He is coming because God promised he would. The angel is telling us, God's word is telling us, I'm telling you this morning that even those who are hurting and who are broken, you too can rejoice because, because God will keep his promises. The promised one came to intervene, to restore lives, to bring light into darkness, to heal your broken hearts, to give you a new life and make eternity with Jesus possible. Woo! Come on, church. Jesus, the Christ, the promised one is here. Open the gift, church. God keeps his word. We can rejoice because he is Savior. He is Christ. And we can rejoice because not only is he Savior Christ, but Jesus is Lord. The angels are surrounding or announcing the birth of, of a child, Jesus, who is Lord. Here's what that means, church. He is the one who is in charge. We're not very good at being in charge, are we? Look at your life. You'll figure it out real quick. He's really good at it. He's the one who is over all things. He is the one who every knee will bow down to, church. He is our leader. He is our shepherd. He is our Lord. He came to us to be with us, and so we rejoice. Church, if that doesn't get you going, I don't know what will. Come on, that's better, with, that's better than pizza, that's better than tacos, that's better than mashed potatoes and gravy and pot roast and T-bone steak, church. Come on, right? I'm excited, I don't care if you all are not, right? This is good stuff, man. This is the best gift, man. And so for our last truth and reason to rejoice this Christmas, notice what the angel says to these shepherds. He says this, it gets really personal. It gets really personal. For today in the city of David, remember he's talking to shepherds, there has been born... For you. Let it sit there for a second. This gift is for you. A Savior who is Christ the Lord. The Savior, the Christ, the Lord, he's here for you. The angel says, hey, shepherds, for you. A shepherd is born. For you, Christ came. For you, the Lord God Almighty is here. Think about the shepherds for a minute. I don't think anyone ever came to these shepherds with any good news for them. These guys were the low guys on the social ladder. They were the outsiders. They were on the fringe church, right? They were forgotten. They were looked down upon. They were not seen as having any value. Church, they couldn't even give testimony in court because their word was not worth anything. They were stinky church. They had very little to their name, but the angel says, hey, he's here for you. Not just the rich, 
not just for those who have it all together. He's not here just for the religious. He is here for you and for all the people. It doesn't matter where you work. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how bad you stink. It doesn't matter what sin you have. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Don't miss it, church. He is here for you. It doesn't matter what others think about you or how others see you. We rejoice this Christmas because if you are a person in here today, y'all people, amen, Jesus came for you. The good news is for you. He came into the world. He became flesh for you. He came to be your Savior. He came to be your Messiah. He came to be your Lord. Don't believe the lie, church. Satan is really good at lying right? He's known as the father of lies. Don't believe this lie from him or anyone else whenever they say you aren't good enough for God or that you aren't religious, uh, religious enough for him or you don't have the right background, right? Or you don't measure up. You can't earn his love, right? Don't miss this. He came for you. He came for all because none of us, church, can be good enough. None of us can earn our way to heaven. I need you to hear me clearly because there's a lot of bad teaching out there that says if you just work hard, it's going to outweigh your bad and you're going to get in. That's a lie from the depths of hell, church. Amen? Let's own it, church. We can't earn our way to God. You want to be with him for eternity? It's through Jesus alone, church. None of us can earn our way to him. None of us can save ourselves or be religious or good enough. That's why Jesus came. The shepherds, they get it. And they respond to this good news for them. They hear the good news. They didn't reject it. They didn't wait. Let that sit with you just for a second. We share the gospel with people. Maybe someone has shared Jesus with you and said, I'll do that later. You may not have a later. I'll do it when I get older. I'll do it once my college days are past. I'll do it once I get out of high school. I'll do it once I'm done with this girl or that guy. I'll do it when I'm done with the drugs. I'll do it when I'm done drinking. I'll do it when I'm done doing what I want to do. There may not be time, church. They went right away. They didn't wait. They said, we've got to go to Jesus because he came for me. Look at verse 15. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, let us go straight. They didn't stop at Best Buy or Walmart or anything. They went right there, church. I don't even know where I was at. That was, let, us, let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a what, church? Hurry. And found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. They went to Jesus in a hurry. Nothing got in their way of going to the one who is the gift for them. And then look at how Mary responds to all of this. Verse 17, when they had seen this, they had made known the statement which had been told them about this child. They're telling Mary and, and Joseph and the animals, right? <laughs> They're listening to, right? All that they had heard and, and, and all who heard it wondered at the things which were told to them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. She pondered, church. We're so bad at pondering, we don't ever use the word. She was amazed. She was in awe of God. She just sat with it. Right? She was in awe of his promises and of the Christ child. She was in awe that Jesus, the Savior, was here. Not just for her, but for the rich and the poor, even the shepherds, he was here. And then one more, we see the response from the shepherds. Verse 20, the shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, just as been told them. Once the shepherds see Jesus, their Savior, their Christ, and their Lord, how do they respond? They worship Him. They glorify God. And they praise Him. Church, we get to do the same thing. This Christmas and for the rest of our lives, we worship Jesus. We glorify Jesus. We praise the Lord for who he is, for his coming, for his love, for his life, for his salvation. You know, Jesus born and laid in a manger, the one from heaven. He actually went to your cross and my cross and hung there and bled and died for you and me. Because he came to be our savior, not just to stay in the manger. Jesus says, I'm it. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I paid the price. I came for you. I'm the gift. Will you recognize your, your sin and your stink? 
and realize you need me because I'm here. I did all the work. What's your response to Jesus today? Christians, our response is to worship him. Our response is to praise him. Our response is to glorify him and to live for him and to tell others about him. If you don't know Jesus today, it doesn't matter how well-known you are, how wealthy you are, how, how many friends you have. It doesn't matter how good you are or how religious you are. You need a Savior. Amen. Let's pray.